authorities. And I'm going to try the exercise as I go through uh, of saying on each one what I say is binding um, and how the doctrine of precedent applies if I can do it that way. Useful, thank you. Um, I'll come back after that exercise to the various points of distinction which have been proposed to the court. And of course, I'll touch on some of those as I go through. Um, my approach, my lord, has been to try to, as it were, assist the court with what is a difficult exercise. Um, I put a particular emphasis on trying to put arguments that other parties aren't putting. Um, but one consequence of that is that actually on occasion, um, I've suggested that there may be a, a different approach, both what the parties have suggested and what the judge suggested on a couple of issues. In particular, I had in mind the Article 8 issue, which I'll come to, um, where um, well, in my submission, the judge didn't uh, arguably give sufficient weight to the possibility that local residents' Article 8 rights might require against the world injunction <coughs> in some travelers' <coughs> rights case. Um, but that's a point which I need to come to rather late on in, in my submissions. I want to start uh, with the, the, the against the world case law. Um, and I'm only going to go to one case on this because uh, OPQ which is in tab 12 of the main authorities bundle, page 266. OPQ. OPQ against BJM. And, my lord, in a sense, it's a strange decision for me to go to because it's a high court decision, whereas actually the authorities, uh, there are lots of House of Lords authorities, but it provides a distilled description of those cases. Which tab um, is it? It's at tab 12 of what? Of Authorities Bundle A, page 266. <coughs> so I go to this because it's just, it's, it's an easy and quick overview um, of the principles. Um, it was a case about an injunction to restrain the sale of um, intimate photographs. Uh, and at H3, at the bottom of page 266, so just on the head note, one sees that the background is copies of the injunction were served on media interests to inform them of the prohibition on publication and of the court's intention to maintain the status quo until trial in accordance with the spy catcher principle. So that's talking about an interim injunction which was against a named person, but copies were served on others to maintain the status quo in accordance with the spy catcher principle where anyone with knowledge of the court's order who published the confidential information and thereby thwarted the purpose of the court would be liable to be punished for contempt. And then over the page, you will see 267 H5, I'm just jumping down a paragraph, but it says there was a pending application to put into effect the terms of the proposed settlement. Until that application was determined, the interim injunction remained in force and the spy catcher doctrine continued to apply. The claimant, concerned that once the interim injunction ceased to have effect, the spycatcher doctrine would no longer hold good, so that he would have no protection against publication by media third parties, applied to the court to grant a final injunction against the world. And you'll see held granting a final injunction against the world. That, that, that was what was granted in the case. So that's just a, 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 a bird's eye um, overview of what the case was about. I want to pick it up, if I may, on page 269. Uh, Um, at paragraph 7, where Mr Justice E.D. describes the background and describes the copies of the injunction were indeed served uh, on media interest to maintain the status quo. Um, and there's an extract there from well, Justice Lloyd, um, in, I think that's in the Spycatcher case, uh, saying at common law, if the court makes an order regulating its own procedure and the purpose of the order is plainly to protect the administration of justice, anyone who subverts that order will be guilty of contempt. And my lord, you'll see down at nine, the judge says it's generally thought that once a permanent injunction has been obtained following a trial or by consent or an undertaking has been given to similar effect, the spycatcher doctrine will no longer apply. 
That's because the court's purpose in holding the Ringling School trial has been overtaken by events. There'll be no need for a trial, and there's a reference to a few cases. I've recently so held in a case which is due shortly to be held at the head in the Court of Appeals. The law may be reconsidered at that stage, but in the meantime, I shall proceed on my present understanding of the position. My, Lord, my understanding is that this then didn't go to the Court of Appeals, so as far as I'm aware, that then wasn't addressed. Um, on the principle that is explained about interim injunctions and spy catcher, could I just refer the court for, for your note to uh, two cases? One is, you'll see in paragraph seven, Lord Justice Lloyd's speech uh, is quoted, but my Lord, you were shown yesterday uh, Lord Oliver in <coughs> spy catcher. So you, you have that, where Lord Oliver made um, the same point. Um, but the same point was then also reiterated by the House of Lords in, in the Punch case. Uh, and I, I don't suggest, my Lord, that you turn that, but for your note, it's in bundle of authorities B, tab C. It starts at page 817. And the principle is expressed in essentially the same way by Lord Nichols at paragraph 32. Uh, Lord Hoffman at paragraph uh, 66 and Lord Hope at paragraph 122. Um, so then moving forwards uh, in, in, in Mr Justice Eady's judgment. So, so the principle is um, that the spy catcher approach, which is that you can um, hold people in contempt for um, interfering with an order, an, an interim order, does not apply after a final order is made. Is that right? Yes, that's the, the, the principle, because the justification that is given for the principle is really as it's summarised here, and as you saw in Lord Oliver yesterday, um, that it's in order not to interfere with the process of the court before the final trial. And, well, Lord, clearly that is, as it were, open to criticism, but that is the way. So, so if, I mean, so it's established, you say, that if a, a person, if there's a final injunction um, not to <coughs> um, deal in infringing copies, let's say, um, against X and Y, if Z deals in infringing copies, that's not a contempt of court. It may be an infringement <coughs> itself. Yes. Yes. Even if they know of the injunction. Yes. It's not a good example. But yes, my lord. Mm. Uh, and as far as I know, although it's been as it questioned here, and it's clearly open to question as a general proposition, it hasn't ever been overruled. And as I say, that is the justification which is given for the doctrine um, by the House of Lords when they've looked at it. Um, uh, Miss Justice Eady then, at paragraph ten, goes on to explain uh, that at the uh, at the end of that. Um, He's been invited to grant an injunction uh, against the world, an injunction of general effect. And this is the start, then, of the discussion of what that jurisdiction uh, is. And as Justice Ede explains, it's a jurisdiction which was widened at first rather tentatively uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Human Rights Act. Paragraph 12, the notion of an injunction against the world appears to run counter to the principle enunciated over two centuries ago by Lord Eldon in Iverson and Harris. And well, that is often treated in these cases as the starting point of that principle. Um, and in my skeleton, I've gone through the House of Lords case. I'm not doing it now, but they, many of those I've cross-referred um, do trace it back to this starting point. At 13, by the time of Spycatcher, although it remained a fundamental principle that the courts act against parties, it's been recognized that there were certain fairly limited exceptions of which the best uh, established is wardship. Um, points out that uh, Mr. Justice Balcom had expressed the view that the power to grant an injunction other than uh, in personam was confined to the wardship jurisdiction. But it's been uh, expanded. Um, and uh, you'll see further down uh, at 16, this traditional terminology and the constraints that tended to accompany it have now been largely superseded as a consequence of the Human Rights Act. The courts have recognized that there is a, a new era. A, a, and that's a reference to Queen Elizabeth 
Butler's loss in Venable's case. And that Venable's jurisdiction, which was in the context of confidentiality orders, broadly speaking, um, is what has effectively then been applied by the House of Lords in the several cases that follow Venables, which are summarized here. And they, they're all cases which, as I say, in broad terms, relate to prevention of publication. Here we're talking about intimate photographs, but it might be prevention of publication, as in Venables, of the names of uh, uh, the identities, I apologize, the new identities and whereabouts of Thompson and Venables. And that, that, that's what the context is for this expansion. But where it takes one is paragraph 18, where Mr. Justice Eby says, it's now acknowledged, therefore, that the court's power to grant an injunction against the world is not confined to the wardship jurisdiction, nor to children, nor to individuals who cannot take care of themselves. The remedy is available wherever necessary and proportionate for the protection uh, of convention rights, whether children uh, or adults. Now, <clears throat> well, I'm going to, if I may, park the question of what that means in these cases and come back to it. Well, is that approved at a higher level? Yes. Yes. Okay. And if one's talking about convention rights, there's no hierarchy of rights in the convention. I mean, leaving okay. aside possibly Article 2 and 3, which no. don't arise here, but apart from those, there's no, there's no order of precedent. There's no sort of ab initio order of preference, um, as it were, no. no. Um, well, the reason you've, I think, not been addressed on this particular human rights issue in any detail by my learned friends is that actually none of them sought injunctions on the basis that they were trying to protect the Article 8 rights of local residents. Um, the reason I raise it, and I'll, I'll show you when I come back to it, but the reason I raise it is that the judge did consider this and it appears from the judgment that he was addressed in broad terms on it. And the answer that he comes to is, well, actually, it would never be appropriate to make an order, even on Article 8 grounds, in a traveller's case. And that's what I query with respect, whether that can be right as a general proposition. But in the, in the case of an entity like HS2, it could be A1P1 rights. That was the relevant convention right. In the yes, but potentially, my lord, I, Certainly some of the cases that have been mentioned to you, one can see quite easily how they could be put within a convention framework. So the Shard injunction, for example, I don't know why it was given. It probably wasn't given for convention rights. But one can well see that if there's a risk to life of people climbing the Shard, then you build an argument quite readily that you have a positive obligation under the convention to protect life. And that may necessitate, if it's the only step that can be taken, the giving of an in injunction against the world. Um, a one people, the only reason, my lord, I've said potentially is that I've not looked into that. And wh what I mean by that is, to get this argument off the ground, you have to, as a first step, show that there is a positive obligation arising under the convention. So an obligation to, to take steps. Why? Here, an obligation Why? to take steps. Well, can I show you when, when I come back to this? It's, uh, in, the, in, these, in these confidential information cases, there was no obligation on the person whose information wants to do anything. Well, that, my lord, is how it's explained by the House of Lords uh, in the Guardian case. So you start from a proposition where you say there's a positive obligation, uh, and indeed in Venables, there was thought to be a risk to life to the individual. And so that, that's the sort of starting point for human rights cases one says, well, the court must have a power, and more than that, must actually act upon a power, because there is a positive obligation on the state to protect these but rights. why are we confining what is undoubtedly a jurisdiction within the court to human rights cases when we acknowledge that the um, authority for the jurisdiction goes back to the early 19th century? I mean, of course the Human Rights Act may provide an example of cases where it would be appropriate. But, but why <coughs> does it become the only example? Well, my Lord, I, 
to be clear, I don't say that it is the, the only example, and indeed there are other examples given here, and one can well imagine incremental extensions of this. And so the question <coughs> here, essentially, is whether there are reasons before you to extend this jurisdiction, uh, as I say, not in a case where Article 8 is being relied on, but more generally, and that in a sense takes one back to all the questions about whether one can distinguish Cameron uh, and so on and so forth. You see, what I question is the first sentence in paragraph 16 of Mr. Justice Eadie's judgment. The, 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 the whole thing is superseded because we've got something called the Human Rights Act. I mean, it, it's, it's not. And you've only got to look at um, Lord Leggett's judgment in convoy collaterals and there that injunctions um, are a very broad concept. My Lord, I entirely accept that. And uh, that first sentence clearly isn't strictly right because there are all these other jurisdictions which he mentions, for example, uh, paragraph 18, where it was always historically... I mean, this is what troubles me about this whole case with, with defending Mr Justice Nicklin's judgment because it puts everything into a single box and sort of closes the lid. And... and as far as I'm concerned, that's a very dangerous thing to do. Um, you know, there are endless different types of traveller case and cases where an injunction might be absolutely imperative against unknown people, whether it's newcomers or against the world. And, and to sort of close the lid and screw it down, as he's done, seems to me a very dangerous um, thing for the courts to be doing. My Lord, I, with respect, entirely agree with that. And I've highlighted, as I say, the Article 8 context, where um, it seems to me it's not right, certainly in that context, to screw down the lid. Now, the question not I think which my Lord is asking is not, not just Article 8. 8. But, my Lord, and the answer to and that is, is and my Lord, I don't mean to dodge that, that point. I entirely take that point. There is a jurisdiction. The court could expand it. But the question yeah. then is, is it being expanded in a way which is consistent with Cameron, and which also is, is an expansion which doesn't, um, as it were, completely undermine the general principles regarding against the world injunctions. And so well, the general we principles regarding against the world injunctions I take as being very broad indeed. And the fact that there have in recent times been examples of the Human Rights Act giving rise to those sorts of injunctions in cases like um, uh, Venables and the one I did of uh, the Edlington boys is, <coughs> is is just an example. It's not not anything more than that. My lord, yes. But what mm -hmm. one then needs to do is to test the justifications which my learned friends put forward for expanding it in this case and to see how wide those would be. And some of, not all of them, I accept that some of those, um, for example, if one were to say, well, injunctions are forward looking, whereas damages are backwards looking. Therefore, you can have an order against the world in an injunction. Clearly, that just would completely undermine the whole basis of the jurisdictions, because that would be applicable in any any against the world injunction. You could always make that argument. So that's why I say it does bring one back to the question of whether there are particular features of this case which can be properly distinguished from other cases and Canada use and so on. It all, um, it all comes down to the ratio in Cameron. My Lord, yes, I agree with that. But the and, widespread, and then, the widespread yeah. grant of against the world injunctions on the basis of what Mr Justice Eady is saying uh, is that it must be both necessary and proportionate. Yes. So in the ordinary case of an injunction against identified individuals to stop them from trespassing or interfering with the right of way or whatever it happens to be, it would not be either necessary or proportionate to grant against the world injunction, it is only where you have, as I'm really aware, you have a fluctuating group of unidentified <coughs> people who are persistently engaged in conduct you want to stop, which would allow it, allow a court to say, yes, it is both necessary and proportionate to grant an order of this kind. <laughs> That is a test which may be met, though, in an awful lot of these cases. Well, 
if it is necessary and proportionate in a lot of cases, what's wrong with granting necessary and proportionate orders? One needs to start, as I say, with the question of whether it's a, a positive obligation, if one's looking at it at least through the human rights lens, mm. whether it gives rise to a positive obligation on the court. Um, but, my Lord, I accept one could, this court could, if it were consistent with Canada Goose, and I'll come back to that, um, craft a much wider exemption. But it would be very wide. It would be a very wide uh, exception to these principles. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the person's unknown case law. Uh, the cases which come before Cameron, uh, of course, need to be treated with some caution because they are subject then to what is said in Cameron. Um, but nonetheless, I do want to look briefly at a couple of them. Um, firstly, there is Bloomsbury, which is in the same bundle at page 86, which is tab 3. discrete point, but it's, it, it, it's, it's that I, in my skeleton argument, said this wasn't the case concerning newcomers. Uh, and Mr. Anderson, um, in his submission, says that it was. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on that, um, because it seems to me it's at the very least ambiguous. And I just wanted to, uh, Bloom's was obviously referenced in a few of the later cases. And I just wanted to um, make clear some of that ambiguity. If one looks at paragraph four, uh, which is on page 88, Um, there is a proposed description there <coughs> of the, the second defendant, um, which if one reads, the person or persons who have offered the publishers a copy of the book or any part thereof, and the person or persons who has or have physical possession of a copy of the book or any part thereof without the consent of the claimants. Now, I accept that that could be treated, be read as, and treated as um, catching uh, newcomers. Um, observe that it isn't described, certainly not described, as uh, an injunction against the world. And on the face of it, it would also be consistent with just covering people who fall within that description uh, at the date of the order. Um, and if one goes forward, please, to the decision at starting from paragraph 18. So what the Vice Chancellor says there is, there, there are two questions. Am I entitled to make the order sought? And if so, should I? The answer to the first question depends on whether and if so to what extent I'm bound by a case of Freon uh, or a case called Wickham. Um, Freon in 19 was decided on two grounds. First, that the prescribed form of writ required the defendants to be named. Second, that the description was too vague. Both points were decided against the background of the regime prescribed by the rules of the Supreme Court. The regime introduced by the civil procedure rules is quite different. There is no requirement that a defendant should be named, nearly direction that he should be. Failure to give a name can't invalidate the proceedings, both because they're started by the issue of the claim from the request of the claimant and because, unless the court thinks otherwise, Rule 310 provides. Um, and he says at the end of that, for these reasons, uh, I conclude that the decision of the court of appeal is not applicable to proceedings brought under the civil procedure rules. So the focus there is on naming individuals rather than on what is really a separate question of whether it could apply to newcomers. Um, and similarly, one sees essentially the same discussion in 20. The decision of Mr. Justice Stamp in In Ray Wicked Terrace is not binding on me in any event. I would follow it unless it was distinguishable or I was satisfied it was wrongly decided. I consider it is distinguishable, being also inapplicable under the civil procedure rules, um, but it's also distinguishable on other grounds. First, the objection in that case was that there was no defendant, and in this case there is. The question is whether he or she has been properly described. So, my lords, my lady, I'm not putting it any higher than that it's ambiguous whether it was actually intended. 
capture um, newcomers. The other case that I do need to go to uh, is, of course, uh, Gamble, because that survives Cameron, at least in some form. I want to skip forward to tab 8, starting at page 165. The language towards the end of paragraph 20 doesn't suggest that the judge has in mind only the people who are brought by the description of the state of the order, does it? My lady, I'm, I apologise, I didn't catch the end of... Well, uh, I'm just looking at the language that uh, Vice-Chancellor uses at the end of paragraph 20. It doesn't really suggest that he's only got in mind people who fall within the description as at the date of the order, does it? The end of paragraph 20. <laughs> Rather the reverse. The objection in that case that the order sought would not bind, not so in this case. The person falling within the description could be liable for contempt if he acted inconsistently with it. Yes, but my lady, the, the point which I'm making is simply that there could be people falling within the description at the date of the order. Well, there could, but, but this language is wide enough to catch people who um, do something after the date of the order. And in fact, that's, that's the natural reading of this passage, isn't it? <coughs> well, lady, I see that. I, as I say, I don't put it higher than that. It seems to me to be ambiguous, and it's mm. not the point, I think, which is expressly discussed in the, in the judgment. But Gamel, tab 8, I want to pick up at page 164, please. 174, I apologise. Um, you've seen this already, but you see the injunction uh, there at B. Uh, and, of course, it says persons are known being persons other than those listed in the schedule to the claim. Sorry, I, I'm afraid I missed the page. Page 174, my lord. Thank you. So it was addressed to persons unknown being persons other than those listed in the schedule to the claim. So there were named defendants as well as uh, unknown persons. And, of course, if one looks at the actual description of unknown persons, that is also drafted wide enough to catch persons who exist at the time when the order is made and people who subsequently breach it. And, and, and the reason I make that observation is that I think Mr Giffin said, as he was talking about Gamel, that the whole purpose, he said, of the injunction was to catch people who breach it after it is made. And in my submission, that may have been one of the purposes, but it wasn't the whole purpose. And the reason that's important, of course, is because when the, our judge, Mr Justice Nicklin, says that interim injunctions will only catch newcomers if there are also parties to the claim, so that the claim can be served and the court has jurisdiction, that particular observation of the judge is not inconsistent with Gamble, and I think yes, it was suggested that that was inconsistent, but it's not, because, as I say, there, there were parties, known and potentially unknown. And that's the description of the injunction. Um, you'll see just under that, uh, the respondents should be restrained until trial or further order. So this particular one was, was, was interim. Uh, from causing or permitting hardcore to be deposited other than for agricultural purposes on land. And then there's uh, the ellipsis. Um, but it's clear you've seen the earlier judgment. What is missed out by those ellipses is basically the rest of the description of the unlawful conduct. So as I said earlier, the description of the parties caught in this injunction was the same as the description of the uh, unlawful conduct. And in fact, what one sees from paragraph 24, that Miss Gamel, uh, what she had done uh, in breaching it was to move on to a plot with her caravan. 
<clears throat> now, the paragraph on which particular reliance is placed by Melinda Friends is paragraph 32. That's on page 178. <coughs> In a sense, this is the only explanation in the judgment of this paragraph. It's not a conclusion, but it's a statement of the, the principle. So this is all there is to explain um, the thinking behind it. And I wanted to just pick up on one point, which is there is a question about what it means to become a party. Um, it's another question which was put to Mr. Giffen. And Mr. Giffen said, well, of course, once one becomes a party, one can then challenge the order. Um, but in my submission, that isn't the consequence of becoming a party, because any person affected by this order could apply uh, under the CPR as an affected person, once they know of the order. And indeed, Mr. Anderson placed some emphasis on that when he was talking about injunctions against newcomers. It's a feature of them that anyone is entitled to apply. And one answer, therefore, to the question, what does it mean to become a party, is a different answer, which is that you are then able to participate in the final trial because you've become identified. And that gives meaning to becoming a party when there's an interim injunction. It gives meaning which my submission is consistent with Cameron. That's why I make the point. I'll come on to Cameron. But that's what the effect of becoming a party is. Well, there may be many effects of becoming a party. I mean, you can become a party and you're liable for costs. You're not normally. Non-parties are only liable under Section 51 or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, it, there's all sorts of consequences of becoming a party. But... <coughs> just saying that if the implication is there has to be a trial and that the trial of the case is some sort of absolute objective in every case, it's a nonsense. I mean, it disregards civil procedure as we know it. I mean, the, the whole point about civil justice, which is quite interestingly different from many other areas, is that there often is not a trial. And when I say often, like 99% of issued cases do not come to trial. So saying that the whole procedure is devoted towards becoming a party to become a trial uh, person is just not reality. No, my lord, I didn't intend to suggest that the whole procedure is... But it's what it sounds that. like, and it's where we're going with Cameron, you see. It's that Cameron was all about that. It was, it was fixated about one aspect of civil procedure when there are zillions of for those of us that spent many, many years doing all sorts of different kinds of cases, you can't just, you can't salami slice civil procedure and say, this case is all about directed towards who's going to be at the trial. Because that just ignores the whole panoply of civil justice. And well, on the question of how long there may be before trial, I mean, clearly it's the case, some of these interim injunctions don't get to trial for all sorts of reasons, but one may be urgency. No, not and of not some, 99%. Yes, well, <laughs> my Lord, yes, although, of course, there is um, a large proportion of those which don't get to trial because the parties don't have the appetite for trial rather than because they don't have the they right to trial. They don't get to trial for an absolute multitude of reasons. But there is, my Lord, on, on, on that particular point, could I just draw to your attention the, the discussion that is in the judgment just on the question of going to trial? Yes. Um, it's starts from page 53 of the, of the first one. Sorry, which paragraph? So it's paragraph uh, 86. 
reasons aren't made for trial. It doesn't have to be quick. It will depend on the circumstances how quickly one would progress from an interim injunction to, to trial. Well, what um, does it mean, so any failure to prosecute a claim in which an interim injunction has been granted as a matter of serious concern? I mean, that is, that is just unrealistic. It may be a matter of serious concern if there is some breach of a court order. It's not, I mean, it, it's, it's with great respect to the judge, it's a, it's a nonsense statement. Well, my Lord, all I draw to your attention is that the judge here goes through a series of cases um, in which it has been said, and they're in contexts involving human rights, most of them, that it's incumbent on the parties, essentially, if I summarise, to progress an interim injunction to trial. And he refers at paragraph 90 to a practice direction where if an order is made without notice, there should be a return date. But these are all media cases. These are, these are all cases in a, a very different context. Well, if you take the case of an ex-employer who wants to restrain an ex-employee from breaching restrictive covenants. It may be only for a month or two before he starts a new job. That would never happen at trial. You get your injunction. That's it. Yes. Well, well, my lord, yes. But obviously one of the factors then that goes into the balancing act when an interim injunction is treated as interim injunction. Mm. But the question then is, will this dispose of the issues? And that has to be based in the balance. Well, you know, we do have to take a very broad view of this. And just looking at it from the point of view of media cases, um, media judges, and um, then extrapolating from those kinds of cases to this kind of case is really not appropriate. <coughs> it's also not appropriate to, to assume that the particular leads to the general. And what you're about to tell me is that some case about identifying a defendant to a road traffic accident has completely, totally changed the law of injunction. And I'm afraid I find that beggar's belief as a matter of precedent. I mean, it just can't. <laughs> the Supreme Court is not able to change the law, despite the fact it might want to in some cases, by just writing on a clean sheet of paper what it would like the law to be, unless it was the ratio of the decision it was asked to make. Yes. And, you know, we, we're miles away from that in Cameron. Well, my Lord, can I go to Cameron? Of course, next, then? of course. I mean, I, I'm just balking because we're, we, what's happened here is that we've, we've got a number of people who have specialist expertise in particular areas and then think that that is the only expertise there is out there. And, and we're looking at civil justice, I'm looking at civil justice, I'm even head of civil justice, on a very broad canvas. And, and I need to be assisted to make sure that what we're doing here is not going to confine or pigeonhole or, or, or handicap the court's future. And, 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 and the direction that it's taking is of great concern to me, I would say. Can I just register a, a, a small concern of my own, which is um, paragraph 86. The judge has assumed that these injunctions interfere with Article 8 rights. Now, it's quite established that Article 8 does not confer a right to a home. So, so what actually is the interference that the judge is talking about here? I mean, you don't have to answer that now, but I'd, I'd sort of like you to answer it at some point. So, my lady, I, I, I'll uh, happily answer it now. Right. Um, one has to go back to, as it were, the, the Bromley principle, where Bromley pulls together... Um, the, the right to adopt a nomadic way of life. Well, it's, it's part well, of the article. But, but, but the, the, the Strasbourg case, Chapman, for example, is very clear that there isn't a right to um, a home and, and you don't have a right to set up camp wherever you like and that planning, planning law is something that may well take priority. So 
the scope for Article 8, I mean, I just have a slight anxiety that quite a small tail is wagging a huge dog here. Well, it's, not, it's not as though these are injunctions uh, by which the state takes children away from their families. I can absolutely understand that there'd be a huge concern about interference with Article 8 rights. I, I, I'm just not persuaded that there's an enormous interference with Article 8 rights in, in these cases. Well, Lady, where there are cases um, in respect of people who occupy land and an injunction is sought, the interference is, as my lord has said, with essentially the right to a nomadic lifestyle, which is part of Article 8. Um, and that is why, in those cases, one has to conduct the proportionality balancing exercise. Yeah, but it doesn't give you a right to override planning law in general or a right to trespass in general. Well, it may give you a right to resist an injunction which is what the court is being asked to do. Um, and that is why, in those cases, one needs to look at, uh, for example, the amount of uh, other provision which has been made available for travellers in a particular area. That's relevant to the balancing exercise. And if the result of the analysis is, to summarise very briefly, but if one comes to the view that travellers can't continue their nomadic lifestyle because of the cumulative effect of lack of appropriate site, borough-wide injunctions and so on, then the result may be that it's disproportionate to, to make an injunction. And that's the balancing exercise that is at the heart of those cases. Now, uh, there isn't the any judge... Strasbourg case that says um, you, you've got a right to... Um, uh, pursue your nomadic lifestyle even though it's unlawful. Is that? I mean, if there is, I'd like you to tell me what, what it is. Uh, but, Lady, can I confess that I'm being taken into a. a yeah, an well, area I, which I, I'm, that's, I'm that's why I said I don't. I, you, know, you, don't you, you don't need to answer that question now because I, I, I'm just a little bit anxious about it. The, the problem with this case, um, Mr. James, is that the judgment seems at every turn to contain binary statements. And that, that is a very dangerous starting point for um, making, uh, there used to be an old saying, hard cases make bad law. And it, when uh, there are a, a series, as we're beginning to see in this judgment, of blanket statements, this is the position across the piece, then I'm afraid my antenna go up because the world is not that simple and I have to be <coughs> to make sure <coughs> that decisions are not reached <coughs> in this court which um, have ramifications they shouldn't have and what appears to be the case with Canada Goose is that well what appears to be the case really with a series of cases you're now coming to is that all of them have ramifications way beyond or are said to have ramifications way beyond what they were about. And that drives a coach and horses through the law's precedent and the common law and is very, very dangerous. So one would be looking um, naturally, intuitively, after so many years in the law, to confine, not expand, the ratio of these cases to what they were really about. But Mr. Justice Nicklin and indeed your submission seem to be doing the reverse. And you know, to find a ratio, it really has genuinely to be what the case decided and the route to which it decided it about the subject matter, not um, some sort of uh, free-handed um, general statement of the law. So I'm just putting that marker down because Mr. Jones you, you need to deal with that point when you come to the critical cases here. Yes. Um, shall I turn then to Cameron? Yes. It starts from page well, 2. 
it up from paragraph 9. under the heading suing unnamed person. Um, and the assumption there says, when the civil procedure rules were introduced in 1999, the function of prescribing the manner in which the proceedings should be commenced was taken over by CPR Part 7. The general rule remains that proceedings may not be brought uh, against unnamed parties. He says this is explicit in the limited exceptions contemplated by the rules. Um, and then at the bottom of the page, the only express provision made for proceedings against unnamed defendant other than representative actions is Rule 55.3, which permits a claim for possession of property to be brought against trespassers whose names are unknown. And further down that paragraph at B is where there is reference to 187B. And what is said is, in addition, there are specific statutory exceptions to broadly the same effect. And he refers to 187B. But broadly the same effect there is a reference back to persons whose names are unknown. So it's not a reference to newcomers, which wasn't being discussed in this paragraph. Um, and you will also see at the end of that paragraph... There weren't any newcomers in the camera. There was one driver who was involved in one accident. Absolutely. So it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a, case, a newcomer's case. It wasn't a newcomer's case. I entirely agree with that. Wasn't a newcomer's case. Um, so, uh, uh, and my lord, I should say that point is made in both Ineos and Canada Goose. Um, at the end of that paragraph, paragraph nine, uh, he then refers to the rules, which should state, among other things, the full name of each party. So he's emphasising uh, there uh, that in a claim form, uh, even there under 187b. Uh, one would have the full name of each party. Now, of course, I'm going to show you the rules that we now have. One doesn't need to do that under 178B now. Um, paragraph 10, English judges have allowed some exceptions. And his lordship refers there, just before E, to the Bloomsbury case. The possibility of a much wider jurisdiction was opened up uh, in Bloomsbury. There's a discussion about Bloomsbury. And then at 11, since this decision, the jurisdiction has been regularly invoked. There's been a significant increase in its use. The main context for its exercise have been abuse of the internet and so on and so forth. And then over the page uh, just before C, in some of these cases, proceedings against persons unknown were allowed in support of an application for a precautionary injunction where the defendants could be identified only as those persons who might in future commit the relevant act. The majority of the Court of Appeal followed this body of case law in deciding that an action was permissible against the unknown driver of the micro who injured Miss, uh, Miss Cameron. This is the first occasion on which the basis and extent of the jurisdiction uh, has been considered uh, by the Supreme Court or the House of Lords. And, my Lord, the first point which I do make is that when one reads that last sentence in light of what has come before, Lordship, certainly on the face of it, seems to be talking generally about the jurisdiction which he's there described and the cases which he has uh, described. But is it right that the person's unknown issue has only come before the Supreme Court in 2019? Well, as far as I'm aware, that's right. Is it? I'm thinking of all the caravan cases. I mean, I, I haven't researched it, but I don't believe that. Well, my Lord, I apologise if I've overlooked those, but that's my understanding. Well, I mean, I, I think it would be very surprising if there'd been no case brought against persons unknown uh, before the Supreme Court before 2019, but uh, I certainly wouldn't take it at face value, maybe of the particular kinds he's talking about. Uh, one then has at the end of 12, well, 12 starts off by saying the civil procedure rules neither expressly authorise or expressly prohibit exceptions to the general rule. Um, and at the end of that paragraph, uh, Mr. Lordship identifies the critical question as being what, as a matter of law, is the basis of the court's jurisdiction over parties? And in what, if any circumstances, can jurisdiction be exercised on the basis, on that basis, against persons uh, who cannot be named? In the circumstances of this case. I mean, you cannot 
and I'm afraid, try as it might, the Supreme, it is not open to the Supreme Court to change the law in every area when it's deciding a case about unnamed defendants to personal injury cases. It can make obiter statements that are applicable, but no more than that. Well, my Lord, can I come back to that when I look at the Youngson case, which is the next case in the, in the bundle? Yes. Um, but my submission essentially is that one needs to look at the reasoning adopted to So you say that it ratio. can change the law on areas that are completely unconcerned with the case uh, just by saying the critical question is this, but without adding the words in the circumstances of this case. Well, my Lord, I'm not saying that it would make any difference if you said the circumstances of this case or not, because looking for the reasoning one goes back to the way in which it's set up in paragraphs 10 and 11. And it's, in my submission, it is a, a discussion which proceeds very heavily on the injunction cases and where your assumption then expressly says at the end of 11 that this is the first occasion on which the basis and extent of, of that jurisdiction, which is described, uh, has been considered by the court's Supreme Court. He's not considering the court's jurisdiction to grant injunction in this case. He's just considering... Oh, sorry, I was at the point sorry. I mean, that, that's, that's right. He's not considering what jurisdiction there is to make injunctions against persons unknown. And so he may say what he likes about it. It's obiter. Well, my Lord, it's only obiter if it's not part of the judge's reasoning. No. It does, you, you cannot expand the ratio of a case, whatever Lord Leggett may have said in Young Sam, in order to, set, to make it whatever you want, just by making it part of your reasoning. That is not the law of precedent. N no, my lord, and I'm, just to be clear, not going to go to Lord Leggett. <laughs> but, but what one must do is look at the reasoning actually adopted. Of course you must look at the reasoning actually adopted in the context of what was being decided. Yes, my lord. And, and not in the context of the fact that there are a lot of analogies <coughs> drawn. I mean, the way judges operate is they say they take bits of one case and another from all sorts of different fields and use it to support their case, like building a snowman and putting the snow in to pack the thing together. But that does not make it part of the essential reasoning to decide the facts of that case. And, and this is a misapprehension which goes very deeply, I'm afraid, in the law, and it causes mayhem, because the whole purpose of the common law is to decide the facts of the case, decide the law as it applies to the facts of the case, and that ha is how it develops. That's why it's been so successful. But if you keep on saying, well, he's brought in reasoning from injunction cases, therefore he's decided the law of injunctions forever and a day, he hasn't. He wasn't intending to. It's not what he was doing. My Lord, can anyway, I... Let's carry on. Make progress through Cameron. Then I'll come to Youngson. And yeah. my Lord, I'll come back. And I, I... My Lord, it may be that on the, the statement of the principle... I, I, my Lord, I don't disagree, I think, with any statement of the principle. It's simply the question of how it applies here. And so, for that, one is only looking... That's the only reason I'm going through Lord Sumption's speech and why I've emphasised um, paragraphs uh, 10 and 11. Yes. Um, well, then at 13 has the introduction of the two categories of case. The first category comprises anonymous defendants who are identifiable uh, but whose names are unknown. The second comprises defendants such as most hit and run drivers who are not only uh, anonymous but can't even uh, be identified. And when one goes forward to 15, I'm going to skip ahead slightly to 15. Which category does Miss Gemmell fall into? Uh, well, she, I, I'm, I'm bound to answer that in accordance with Ineos and um, Canada Goose, which say that it's a different category. Newcomers are different categories. So, my Lord, I'm category, bound to give that cat answer. Category two, or is it a third category? Well, it would be a third category. And the, the third category. It would have to be. The reason I say I'm bound to give, I, I, I show when we come to those cases, they both yeah. say that. Um, so, but, so if there is a third category, it follows that what Lord Sumption said cannot be comprehensive. Yes, it would follow. 
um, and one would then have to ask uh, how the logic, mm. as it were, would apply. Um, and uh, I, I, well, to answer that question, one has to start from the proposition that I'm right in my starting point, which I may be wrong, but if I'm right on the starting proposition that it applies to injunctions, including to the second category of person, Injunctions, so unidentifiable but existing persons unknown. Um, ask the question: Why? Why? What's the logic for that? I'm going to come on to the logic. The logic would be fairness so that you can't serve them, and so on. Um, but that same logic, I'm right. But the same logic must, in my submission, apply to uh, newcomers. They're people who also can't be served. Um, in fact, they're much less likely. I mean, I mean, on its face. Interest. It's applying to possession cases against squatters who are identifiable in, or identifiable by their location. And he's talked about squatting cases as being 113 cases, which, as my Lord pointed out, is possession, and um, hit and run drivers. So the idea that this is some kind of comprehensive attempt to um, identify people who um, as the categories of case in which there are unknown or unidentified persons is 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 very far reaching. I mean, it's not. It's just two categories that he's identified. Well, in thirteen, he is in my submission giving two categories. He wasn't thinking about newcomers, but apart from newcomers, was giving uh, a comprehensive categorization of unknown persons, and he gives two examples. Squatters is an example. Um, he says, for example, identified by their location, um, and hit and run it to drivers, that's another example that he gives. Well, we know where he's going, which is why he's talking about communicating with them. Yes. But he's, it's, it's not directed at injunctions. Anyway. Um, one then goes, as I say, to 15. Uh, an identifiable but anonymous defendant can be served with the claim form. This is because it's possible to locate or communicate with the defendant and to identify him as the person describing the claim form. Um, and therefore, for example, proceedings against anonymous trespassers, service has to be um, effected. Um, and in this paragraph, which is dealing with uh, identifiable but anonymous defendants, you get on the next page where an interim injunction, I'm just before B here, where an interim injunction is granted and can be specifically enforced against some property or by notice to third parties who would necessarily be involved in any contempt, the process of enforcing it will sometimes be enough to bring the proceedings to the defendant's attention. Uh, and he says, in Bloomsbury Publishing, for example, the unnamed defendants would have had to identify themselves as the persons in physical possession and the Court of Appeal has held that where proceedings were brought against unnamed persons and interim relief was granted to restrain specific acts, a person became both a defendant and a person to whom the injunction was addressed, and that's obviously uh, Gamel. And at the end of that, in the case of anonymous but identifiable defendants, these procedures for service are now well established, and there's no reason to doubt their juridical basis. So Mrs. Is Gamble was identifiable at the moment that she breached the injunction, not before. That's right. That's right. Why, why does the word interim make all the difference? Yeah. Because the assumption is describing there a particular feature of that kind of interim case where a person can become a defendant uh, before the final trial. By doing one of the acts. And that action of doing the act is what makes them an identifiable defendant. So it's a mechanism which moves a person from being affected by the against the world effects of an injunction, an interim injunction, to being a person who then falls within the category of an identifiable defendant, an actual party to the proceedings. And, and that, in my submission, is how Bloomsbury 
is explained. Uh, I apologize, how Gamble is explained uh, in this decision. <clears throat> um, one then has to pick it up again just to, at 17. Uh, he's talking here about uh, unidentifiable persons. At 16, he was talking about unidentifiable persons. He says, this is, in my view, a more serious problem than the courts in their more recent decisions have recognised. Justice in legal proceedings must be available to both sides. It's a fundamental principle of justice that a person cannot be made subject to the jurisdiction of the court without having had such notice of the proceedings as will enable him to be heard. The principle is perhaps self-evident. The clearest statements to be found in the case to about enforcement of foreign judgments. Uh, the English courts will not enforce or recognise a foreign judgment, even if it's been given by a court of competent jurisdiction, if the judgment debtor had no sufficient notice. Uh, the reason is that such such a judgment will have been obtained in breach of the rules of natural justice. And, and that, in my submission, is the reason for the rules which Lord Sumption has previously described. By the reasons on a separate occasion, that one can't, that, I apologise, my Lord, that, that, that one cannot obtain uh, final relief against a person who uh, hasn't been identified and served with the proceedings before the final relief is given. But you can. As we know. As you've just spent half an hour submitting. Uh, my Lord, I apologise. I, I, so, I, I, my, does my Lord have in mind the, the against the world cases? I apologise. I clearly, those cases are not here considered because what's being discussed is the circumstances in which one can be made a party to the proceedings. Um, and that's why I said at the outset that the effect of Cameron here is simply that whatever the rules are on suing newcomers, they need to be consistent, of course, with what is said in Cameron. <coughs> so if I'm wrong about Cameron applying to injunctions, my lord, then that would be a complete answer. I completely accept that. I completely accept that. And the, argument which I'm putting to you uh, is that it does apply to injunctions um, and that they are repeatedly referred to as part of the, the reasoning of the judge. Now in Youngson... Sorry, just, just before... I'm so sorry, Mr Jones, just before we leave Cameron, um, Lord Sumption seems to assume that the injunction in Gamble was, a, was an interim injunction, but, but I'm not clear where that comes from because if one looks at the decision of the court on um, the unreported decision that precedes the reported um, decision about contempt, it doesn't seem to me to say anywhere that it was an interim injunction. No, uh, my lady, there's, you can answer that in three stages. Um, oh. the, the simple answer is one actually gets it from the later judgment. So in page 174, Uh, just under C. There's the description of the order was in these terms. The response should be restrained until trial or further order. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, well, I think it's accepted <coughs> by everyone that Gamble itself was interim. Now, I should say, my lady, for uh, the court's benefit, that is not clear. Uh, and one of my learned friends made this point, and I agree with it, that is not clear um, when one looks at the, the other case, which is considered by the Court of Appeal in Gamel, which is the, the Morn case, um, the, the Bromley and Morn case, and one doesn't see uh, any description of that as being yeah. uh, interim. And so, um, my lady, one could make that same point that you've put to me um, in relation to the Gamel, because although the Gamel case was, uh, the other one perhaps wasn't. Right, that's um, very helpful. But, my lady, but the answer which I give in general terms to that is that the effect of paragraph 15 <coughs> uh, of the judgment in Cameron is that what survives of Gamel is its ability, the ability of that procedure to apply in an interim injunction case. Sur sorry, what survives? How do you mean survives? What I mean by that, my lady, is that if Morn, if the Morn case was not an interim injunction 
that wouldn't, as it were, be authority for the proposition that one can use the same mechanism um, as was used in the Gamble case in a final injunction situation because Lord Sumption has explained that that mechanism is an interim relief mechanism. Well, what he says at the end of paragraph 15 is a very oblique way of saying he yes. disapproves of more but approves Absolutely. Gamble because it's an interim injunction case. He says these procedures are now well established. There's no reason to doubt their juridical basis. Yes, my lord, but he's talking about it says just before the Court of Appeal has held that where they brought against unnamed persons an interim relief was granted. So that's the juridical basis. Well, I mean, that you proposed. say that, but I mean, that's elevating the word interim relief um, into something that the judge has not said. It, 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 it has not, it, it, it's not, has not said it. I mean, you just say that because of the later case. That's not what he's the distinction he's drawing here. He's just saying that the Court of Appeal has held that where proceedings were brought against unnamed persons and interim relief was granted to restrain specific acts, the person became a defendant, describing what was decided in, in, in his understanding of Gamel. He doesn't say the most important thing about it is that it was interim. My Lord, he doesn't say that, but if I'm, it all goes back, I think, to the question of whether I'm right that this judgment applies to injunctions. But it wasn't argued. But, but my Lord, can I come back to that when I look at Youngson, but just on this particular point about interim relief? Because if I am right that it applies to injunctions, mm. including, therefore, injunctions against unknown, unidentifiable defendants, and one can't get a final injunction against an unidentifiable defendant, then that proposition would, of course, be completely inconsistent with Gamble. And so if I'm, as it were, right in my starting point, then one has to look at 15 and say, well, is, is the judge there suggesting that, A, his judgment doesn't apply to injunctions, or is he rather suggesting that there is an exception for interim injunctions? Or is he just describing how he understands the law about injunctions to be, without without changing it? Uh, my lady, yes, but his description of it is in relation to the granting of interim relief. Youngson then starts at page 293. <coughs> um, and, and really, the only point that I draw from this is that extract from Cross at 310, page 310, paragraph 21. Uh, the binding reasoning of a case is any rule of law expressly or impliedly treated by the judge as a necessary step in reaching his conclusion, having regard to the line of reasoning uh, adopted by him. And one sees then in the next paragraph, it might be the key words contained in the statement of Professor Cross are treated by the judge as a necessary step in reaching his conclusion. In Whiston, Baroness Hale would have reached the same outcome as the majority, but would have done so on the basis of a narrower proposition of law. Lord Newberger and the remaining members of the Supreme Court decided the question was on the basis of a wider proposition of law. And uh, the decision in 25. Uh, is that there can be no doubt that the majority of the court treated the wider proposition as a necessary and decisive step, and as such, it represented the reasoning um, of the case. Um, 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 and that, that, that is all. It's then simply a question of how one reads Cameron. And my Lord, I've given one reading of Cameron, but it, it may be, my Lord, that it can be read in a different way. But my submission on that you have is that he's... Well, we have your submission and due facet.
based a headwind, um, Mr. Jones, which um, uh, I'm sorry for, but uh, we have your submission. Well, before I go to the next case in this bundle, I want to take a, a, a very short detour. Um, which is simply uh, to, to make this point. A, a, a assume in Cameron, just sticking with Cameron for a moment, assume that in Cameron the unknown driver had been sued, one could have sued the unknown driver. Um, assume that that were permissible. Um, and then assume that at some later point they had learned about the award of damages um, against them. Uh, they would at that point have been able to challenge that decision. That's CPR 39.3. And I've put in the bundle, I just want to show you this briefly, a case of Pereira on this. It's in bundle B, tab C49, which is page 1371. had no jurisdiction, has no jurisdiction to grant an application under 39.3 to set aside a judgment given or order made against a party who was not present unless all three conditions listed in the rule are satisfied. Where they are satisfied, it would require very unusual circumstances for the court to refuse the application. And over the page, 1373, um, at the top of that page, you will see what the application was. By an application dated 8th of July 2009, the first defendant applied under 39.3 to set aside that part of Judge Milligan's order which had ordered rescission, rectification, damages. Uh, that application was refused and it was um, appealed. And the principles uh, are in Lord Negro's judgment 1377, paragraph 24. First, the application to appeal Judge Ellis' refusal under 39.3 to set aside the order. An application to set aside judgment given in the applicant's absence is now subject to clear rules. As was made clear by Lord Justice Simon Brown, the court no longer has a broad discretion whether to grant such an application. All three conditions in CPR 39.3 must be satisfied. And then there is here a little description of what those conditions are. So if the application is not made promptly, or if the applicant has no good reason for being absent from the original hearing, or if the applicant would have no substantive case at retrial, the application set aside must be refused. On the other hand, if each of those three hurdles is crossed, it seems to me it would be a very exceptional case where the court did not set aside the order. It's a fundamental principle of any civilised legal system enshrined in the common law in Article 6 of the Convention that all parties in the case are entitled to have their case heard, um, and so on. Um, um, my Lord, my lady, I draw your attention to that only um, because uh, it is important context when we we'll consider some of the submissions that you have heard about the distinction that there is said to be between injunctions and awards for damages. And some of those submissions, especially in the skeleton, have suggested that damages, this is Mr. Giffen's forward looking versus backward looking, but um, the de injunctions can be challenged whereas awards for damages can't, and that that's a, a, a point of distinction. And in my submission, that is not. Uh, a, a valid point of distinction because even in a case, even in Cameron itself, um, it couldn't, <coughs> uh, the unknown driver couldn't be made a party because that would be unfair. But even if he had or she had been made a party, um, they would have been entitled to challenge it later on. <coughs> um, next, I want to go to Ineos, which is then back in bundle A. Uh, tab 15, so page 324. 
rise for me. Can I say um, at the outset that, uh, that my lord, if Ineos had not been followed by Canada Goose, and one were to ask the question, what is the binding reasoning of Ineos? I would say the binding reasoning of Ineos is that Cameron deals with proceedings against unidentifiable persons unknown, but not about proceedings against newcomers. <clears throat> that is what Lord Justice Longmore says at paragraph 29, which, as I say, if one were to read this without uh, Canada Goose contains what in my suspicion would be treated as the binding reasoning um, of this case. So what do you say? The binding reasoning of this case is changed by Canada Goose? Yes, my lord, because Canada Goose then explains INEOS as being confined to interim injunction cases. And well, if one takes a step back and just applying the rules of precedent, um, INEOS itself, in my submission, draws a distinction with Cameron, which doesn't, in my submission, make uh, sense when set against the logic of Cameron, because I've already um, made the point that if Cameron does apply to injunctions against unidentifiable but existing unknown persons, then that logic would seem to apply to newcomers. But INEOS distinguishes it, and it distinguishes it on the basis that it applies to newcomers, and so I would say, well, that is a point of distinction which would then be binding. But of course, the same principle, which is a later case, confining and explaining a previous case, then has to apply to in yours itself, when one comes to does Canada it not really goods. depend on what the ratio of Cameron really is? I mean, if the ratio if, if the ratio of Cameron is um, contrary to your submission, not about injunctions at all. Yes. Right. Then Ineos is 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 unproblematic, and Canada Goose is problematic. And if not, not. Yes. I mean, so it all really comes back to the ratio of, of Cameron. Yes. And I mean, I know we come back to it a lot, but what, what I'm looking for is, is your explanation as to how a case that is about the, identi the, the um, identity of a hit and run driver to a damages claim um, can be extended to any claim. I mean, I suppose you say, do you, that that is part of, you go to Young Sam and you say, well, if you take Young Sam at completely face value, part of his essential re reasoning was that any claim brought against a person unknown um, cannot run, despite the fact whether it's an injunction or not, he mentioned Junctions, so that's the ratio. Uh, well, well, yes, my lord, I, I wouldn't put it quite like that, but yes. No, of course it's, not, it's not that he mentioned, but, but yes, I, my lord, yes. I, I, you say un unidentifiable, unidentifiable. So, unidentifiable so if you have a stream of reasoning from the hit and run driver to persons unknown, you can found, as they said in, in Young Sam, if the, if the reasoning is founded on a broad principle encompasses everything, every action brought against a person unknown, then that's enough to make it ratio. Yes. What you say. Okay. Yes. But, well, of course, is there, are there any other examples of that being held to be ratio directly by the Supreme Court or by the Court of Appeal? I mean, that may be your homework. Maybe that's my homework, my lord. I mean, there's certainly if this is what my lord is asking, but cases where, as it were, a broader, a broader reading is accepted to be the ratio. Yes, my lord, I'll, I'll 
Can I take that as homework? There are cases that because I think that would be perhaps not. I, I think that would be very persuasive if, if the Supreme Court, for example, had said, "Well, it's perfectly clear that this was the ratio, despite the fact this was a case about um, uh, you know one thing. It actually applied to the whole range of litigation." Yes, yes. Well, my lord, I would take that away mm. um, and do what I can. But my lord, there's another point which, of course, comes into this, which is. In a sense, when one goes through these cases, you have to take them one by one, um, and b because there are all sorts of permutations. Because obviously, <laughs> what I've sought to do is start with camera and identify the principle of that, and then apply that to the next case, and apply that to the next case, and so on. But if I'm wrong at any particular stage in that, um, then in a sense, one is back to the starting point because you have to do the same exercise again, but with the right link. At chain, there's all sorts of permutations. We come to Canada Goose, which is of course what the, the last link in the chain, but the consequences of Canada Goose may depend in part on some of the earlier ones. So, my lord, that may be, I hesitate to offer up more homework for myself, but my lord, I, I looked at Mr Giffen's notes and I'll um, deal with that as I go through. But of course, what I've not addressed in my submissions to you is, what if I'm wrong on my starting point about camera? Um, and how then do the principles of precedent apply to the later? Case? I know. I mean, it's a it's one of these flowcharts, really. It's a flowchart because it can change quite dramatically depending on where you're wrong. Yes, or right. absolutely, absolutely. And and one of the difficulties with this also is that Mr. Giffen's notes um, is unhelpfully, but I don't mean this in a criticism at all. But he's trying to take it as broadly as he can, so he just says it's inconsistent with all these cases. Um, rather than saying um, this is the way the flowchart works. But we are going to have to decide how the flowchart works. Absolutely. Because otherwise we can't see if we're bound by Canada Goose or whether it is truly flow interior. Yes. M my lord, yes. So I will come back on that. I, I, I okay. do what I can today, but um, whether I can address every permutation of the flowchart. You, know, um, you, you probably don't need to. You've heard the court's concerns. Yes. I mean, all three of us in different ways have expressed different concerns. Uh, Mr. Justice, Lord Justice Longmore and Ineos. Yes, well, my Lord, I, didn't, I, I said what I have to say about Ineos, which is uh, one needs then to read it in light of Canada Goose, so I'll pick that up when I come to Canada Goose. Right. I can't remember if it's a permanent injunction or an interim. Interim. Uh, Sorry, is this an INEOS? INEOS. Yeah, so paragraph 14, Yes. the judge says, um, will an amendment special ground law factory yes. presume make an interim order pending trial, and that a similar order would then be made at trial? Yeah. Yes, m my lord, I apologise. It's, it's interim, which is how Canada Goose is able to confine it to interim in my yes. submission. Yes. I, I should perhaps just show you 29, which is where I say that the reasoning of this case can be found. Um, because I've, I've made the point that if one just reads it on its own, it, it, it does draw a distinction with Cameron, which is uh, based on newcomers. And, and what is that? Page, uh, paragraph 29 is on page 330. Um, he's responding to a submission which has been made, which is that Cameron precludes the grant of these yes, interim injunctions, although that isn't drawn out here. Um, and uh, what is said there is, despite the persuasive manner in which these arguments are advanced, I can't accept them. In my judgment, it's too absolutist to say that a claimant can't, can never sue persons unknown unless they're identifiable at the time the claim form was issued. That was done in Bloomsbury, Hampshire Waste. Ms. Harrison shrank from submitting that Bloomsbury was wrongly decided, um, since it obviously met the justice case, but she did submit that Hampshire Waste was wrongly decided. She submitted those distinctions injunctions against persons who existed but could not be identified, and injunctions against persons who did not exist and would only come into existence when they breached the injunction. But the supposedly absolute prohibition on suing unidentified persons is already being departed from. Lord Sumption's two categories apply to persons who do exist, some of whom are identifiable and some of whom are not. But he was not considering persons who do not exist at all and will only come into existence in the future. I do not consider he was intending to say anything adverse about suing such persons. Um, and you've seen, my lord, he then, uh, Justice Longmore then goes on to make 
potential points which were learned friends have but made. But look at the submission that. he's rejecting. That's the paragraph 28. Yes. The submission is that the categories, that is Lord Sumption's categories, were exclusive categories. Were exclusive. And that the defendants in INEOS were category two. Yes. That's the submission that Lord Justice Longmore is rejecting. He's yes. saying, no, there aren't exclusive categories. And I think you accepted a little earlier that there is a third category into which Miss Gemmell fell. Yes. Yes. So, so that is, and I accept that is, when one reads this, yeah. the, the, the reasoning on the face of it. I, it's worth noting, though, that that is not, therefore, distinguishing Cameron on the basis that it doesn't apply to injunctions. It is a different form of yes. distinction. Uh, but he does say at 30 that there is no conceptual or legal prohibition on suing persons unknown who are not currently in existence but will come into existence when they commit the prohibited tort. Now, that's not saying that there is no conceptual problem in obtaining interim relief against such a person. That's saying there's no conceptual problem in suing them. Yes. My Lord, I didn't mean to say yes blithely, but yes, and yeah. that's why I have said what I've said, and one has to then look at Cameron. Yeah, that's why you say that if any <laughs> ask, if it, if any ask is, it stands, yes, then you're in trouble. Yes. Yeah. So the judgment's wrong. Yes. Yeah. If it's in those terms. Um, Bromley, tab sixteen, um, page three three five. Um, you would think my Lord already have the point on this, which is that the injunction in this case wasn't made because it was disproportionate and it was an appeal against that uh, decision. Um, and the, su subject to one point, the... Sorry, can you say that again? I didn't, I didn't think I, I got that. The injunction I, I in this case was well. what? Um, the injunction in the uh, at first instance was not made because it was thought not to be a proportionate injunction. Yes, yes. And so the appeal is only about that question. And there is an underlying premise that such injunctions could be made. This is a case concerning final injunctions uh, against newcomers. So there is, subject to one point, which I'll come to in a moment, there is an underlying premise that such injunctions could be made. Um, but simply applying as it were, the rules of precedent, that does not make it... So it's all Overton? Yes, my Lord, it's Overton. Now, it's subject to this point, which I think you were given a reference to paragraph 108, uh, which is on page 367. Um, where you'll see, Dr. Justice Coulson says, whilst I, whilst I do not accept the written submissions produced on behalf of, the, behalf of the third intervener to the general effect that this kind of injunction should never be granted, the following summary of the points noted above may be a useful guide. Now those, I, I, we, of course we don't know what those submissions were. That intervener was uh, Liberty. Um, so the extent to which those submissions chime with the submissions which I've been making to you, um, we don't know. Um, and of course it wasn't, it, there wasn't as it were a cross appeal on this point as there would have needed to be if anyone were actually calling into question whether the injunctions could be made in the first place. Uh, so that's as close as one comes to being able to say this particular issue was before the court in Bromley. But my submission is that that doesn't get one as far as treating Bromley as binding precedent on, on the question of whether such injunctions can be made against... So it does, it does highlight the danger in giving a guidance, a summary, um, giving a useful guide uh, yes. when it's not a matter of decision in the case. Yes. So you, your point about Bromley is that, that, that these injunctions could, in theory, be granted is, a, is an unexamined premise of the judgment and you can't bind anyone. That's right. Yes, that's right, my lady. Um, quadrilla uh, is the next tab, and it starts at 369. 
And again, I show you this only to make the point that this actually also doesn't address the issue, and one sees that page 378, paragraph 50. Uh, and at the end of the paragraph, the court makes clear what, if any, difference it makes in this regard that the injunction is sought against unknown persons, add in parenthesis, including newcomers, is a question which does not need to be decided on the present appeal, but which may, as I understand, arise on the pending appeal from the decision of Mr. Justice Nicholson in Canada Goose. And in the circumstances, I express no uh, opinion on that point. So it's made its way into the essential authority, but actually it doesn't say anything about this issue. Um, and that then brings me to Canada Goose. starting from page 390. <coughs> um, there, there, there are really two important points that I take from Canada Goose. One is that it treats INEOS as an interim case. Um, and the second is that the principle which I say is adopted by the Court of Appeal is that a final injunction against newcomers is only permitted if it can be brought within one of the established quotes against the world exceptions. Um, can I pick it up, please, on... Can we just work out what the court was deciding? It was a summary judgment application um, where the judge held that the claim form had not been validly served on any defendant and it wasn't appropriate to make an order dispensing with service, discharged the interim injunction and refused to grant a final injunction and the appeal was dismissed. In a, in a case about protesters yes. protesting on the public highway? Yes. Okay. So I pick it up then at page 405. And interestingly, I, mean, I, I notice in the headline it says Ineos and Cameron apply. Yes. Yes. Quadrilla considered. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Well, my lord, I, 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 I hope it's not rude if I make the observation that none of these cases, including Mr. Justice Nicklin's judgment, um, express or identify what on the face of it seems to be inconsistencies <laughs> between some of these judgments. And so... When it says INEOS applied, um, what that means is that INEOS is discussed under the heading of interim injunctions and treated as an interim injunction case. Um, but there isn't a uh, lengthy discussion of that particular point, uh, my lord. But, well, that's the curiosity of the reasoning. They, they summarise INEOS at some length, but then don't, in their um, reasoning from paragraph 89 onwards, clearly say anything about INEOS, do they? No, well... I think it may be referred to 92, actually. But, well, is broadly speaking, I, I, I agree. But there's a, there's a, there's a refer I'm being told, yes, of course. Uh, uh, yes, there's, there's a, there's a glancing 90. reference to any in mm -hmm. line three of paragraph 92. Yes, my lady, I'm, someone is whispering to me another reference, but I'm afraid I... Maybe there is another one, but I haven't spotted it. Well, in ER's Oh, it's, of course, it's referred to in 90. Oh, yes, it's, it's referred, referred to in 90. 
Ineos is referred to dozens of times in this chapter. But, but, but those are two really glancing references. There's no engagement with the reasoning of Ineos in, in sort of paragraph 89 onwards. No. Well, Milady, can I go through it? One sees more of it in, under the heading interim injunction. Um, mm. and so I'll, if, I may, if I start with that section and show you how Ineos is treated there. Yeah. Um, it starts from page 405. Um, you have the heading interim relief against persons unknown uh, it's established that proceedings may be commenced and an interim injunction granted against persons unknown in certain circumstances uh, that was expressly acknowledged by the Supreme Court uh, in Cameron uh, and they say and put into effect by the Court of Appeal in the context of protesters in Ineos uh, and Quadrilla now, there is then a discussion of Cameron, which starts at 58. In 63, if I can just jump forwards to that, uh, the court says it will be noted that Cameron did not concern and Lord Sumption did not expressly address a third category of anonymous defendants who are particularly relevant in ongoing protests and demonstrations namely people who will or are highly likely in the future to commit an unlawful civil wrong. Um, he did, however, refer with approval to a Gamble case, in which the Court of Appeal held that persons who entered onto lands and occupied it in breach of and subsequent to the grant of an interim injunction became persons to whom the injunction was addressed and defendants to the proceedings. Um, Lord Sumption also referred to INEOS, the Court says at 64, um, there is then a rather a lengthy description um, of INEOS. Um, so in paragraph 64, Lord Sanctuary is referring to INEOS at first instance. Yes, you refer to INEOS at first instance, that's right, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but the description which then follows is actually through the Court of Appeal. Sure. Um, and there is reference to those paragraphs that we've been discussing, including just at the end of 66. Lord Justice Longmore concluded there's no conceptual legal prohibition on pursuing persons unknown, not in existence, but will come into existence when they commit the prohibited tort, who we call newcomers. Um, and at 67, the court is picking up here on the guidance that was given um, in INEOS. So having regard to those matters, uh, Lord Justice Longmore said at paragraph 34, that he would tentatively frame the requirements necessary for the grant of the injunction against unknown persons uh, as follows. And you, you'll see there that there is a, 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 a citation of all the, the requirements for the grants of such um, injunctions. And, and, and the case then goes on to discuss whether those really are, whether that really is a full statement um, of the requirements. And I want to skip forward to 4.11, where that discussion is sort of brought to a close. It's a page, paragraph 82. Where the court then says, building on Cameron and the INEOS requirements, it's now possible to set out the following procedural guidelines applicable to proceedings for interim relief against persons unknown in protester cases like the present one. And what you then have is, essentially, the INEOS guidance with a tweak which we don't need to be concerned with, but expressed to be applicable to interim injunctions. In protester cases? <coughs> yeah. uh, yes, in protester cases, yes, yeah, like, like the present one. I mean, it's notable that that's not the only time they say this is out of protester cases. I, I agree with that, and I don't have to come back to that, um, because it appears it, maybe more importantly under the heading final injunction. So, INEOS is, is there treated as uh, an interim case under the heading of interim injunctions. And on page 413, there's then the discussion of final orders um, against persons unknown. Um, Number 89, a final injunction cannot be granted in a protester case against persons unknown who are not parties to the date of the final order. 
that is to say, newcomers who do not by that time, who have not by that time committed the prohibited acts and so do not fall within the description of the persons unknown, who have not been served to the claim form. There are some very limited circumstances, such as in Venables, in which a final injunction may be granted against the whole world. Protester actions like the present proceedings do not fall within that exceptional category. The usual principle which applies in the present case is that the final injunction operates only between the parties to the proceedings. That's by catcher. That's consistent with the fundamental principle in Cameron that a person can't be made subject to the jurisdiction of the court without having such notice of the proceedings as will enable him to be heard. Now, just pausing there, um, my lord, this is clearly a very important question. What, what did the court mean when they said the final injunction cannot be granted in a protester case? But my submission on that is that it is clear when you read paragraph 89 that what the court is saying is a protester case doesn't fall within one of the Venables type exceptions. That's the reason they give. So there are limited circumstances, they say, where you can get final injunction against persons unknown who are newcomers. But they are the Venables type case, what I've been calling the against the world cases. And what the court is saying that is that th that group of exceptions doesn't apply here. And instead what one has is the usual principle, which is said to be consistent uh, with Cameron. And one then goes on at 90, and Canada Goose has written skeleton argument to the appeal. It was submitted that um, Bastet leads his authority to the contrary, uh, leaving aside as a first instance decision. So uh, is this, is this ratio? Yes, 89. Why is 89 uh, ratio? The, the last sentence. That is. <clears throat> um, I mean, the decision here was to refuse a final injunction. Yes. On the basis that um, it was sought against persons unknown. Yes. So that's the ratio of the case, you say. Uh, Yes, and as explained in 89, it doesn't fall within one of the categories where such injunctions can be given. Okay. All right, keep going. And those categories are the, basically the Venables categories. So just, just picking up my Lord's question, at 88, the court says that the judge was bound to dismiss Canada Goose's application for summary judgment, <coughs> both because of non service and for further reasons. Yes. So they've already decided that it's right. Yes, well, this is one of those cases where there are two, two. bases for a judgment, but they may both be the binding reasoning. And I mean, as you say, 89 is essentially the reason, but you, it's, it's given a bit more colour. When you, when you come to look at, there's then a discussion of Canada, uh, I apologise, of Cameron. Um, and at 91, that does not mean to say there's no scope for making persons unknown subject to a final injunction. That is perfectly legitimate, provided the persons are confined to those within Lord Sumption's Category 1 in Cameron, namely those anonymous defendants who are identifiable as having committed the relevant unlawful acts prior to the date of final order and have been served prior to the date. The proposed final injunction which Canada Goose sought by way of summary judgment was not so limited. Uh, Ms Justice Nicklin was correct to dismiss the summary judgment on that further ground in addition to non-service. And so... What is being said here is you can't, in general, obtain final injunctions against newcomers. That's the logic of Cameron. I've showed you they, they've accepted that Cameron doesn't actually decide newcomers, but it is the logic of Cameron, the court says, and that's what's in 91. But subject to the Venables against the world uh, case law uh, exceptions. Uh, and then one sees, this is where they come back to Ineos, in written submissions following the conclusion of the oral hearing, the appeal, Mr. Bowes submitted that if there's no power to make a final order against persons unknown, it must follow that contrary to INEOS, there's no power to make an interim order either. Um, I just observed it's only being referred to as an interim case. I'm not saying this is the full explanation of INEOS as an interim case, but it's being treated here as an, a, a, an interim injunction case. We don't agree. An interim injunction is temporary relief intended to hold position until trial. In a case like the present, time between the interim relief and trial will enable the to identify wrongdoers, either by name or as anonymous persons within Lord Sumption's Category 1. 
uh, subject to any appeal, the trial determines the outcome of the litigation between the parties. The trial is between the parties to the proceeding. And so, as you say, th those paragraphs are the, the, the reasoning <coughs> on final injunction uh, of Cam Canada Goose. Um, now, Mr. Anderson, I think, took you to paragraph 93 and urged you to accept 93 uh, as the, the reasoning. Um, my suspicion is that once you've read 89 to 92, where clearly that, that is a discussion of legal principle, 89 to 92, 93 is a sort of standing back and looking at this in the round paragraph. As the judge identified, Canada Goose's problem is that it seeks to invoke the civil jurisdiction of the courts as a means of permanently controlling ongoing public demonstrations by a continually fluctuating group of protesters. And the court goes on then to say that it's using private litigation uh, to address public um, disorder. Um, and at the end of that paragraph, the civil justice process is a far blunter instrument intended to resolve disputes between parties to litigation who have a fair opportunity to participate. Now, I want to go next to Mr. Kiffin's note and just to say. So, just before you do, um, to summarise, you accept that if Cameron doesn't, if the ratio of Cameron is wrongly described in this case, yeah. um, namely that it doesn't apply to injunctions at all. Um, then uh, the, the reasoning falls away here. Well, my, my lord, that's the flowchart issue that I'm taking as homework, but I think okay. to, to preview what I think might be the difficulty with that mm -hmm. is that, of course, it is also a rule of precedent, generally, and I'll need to dig out the authorities on this, that, that a description by a later case here, yes. Canada Goose, of the ratio of an earlier case here, Cameron, is binding on subsequent courts. Now, that's how, what I was thinking. How firm that principle is, I'll... Well, unless um, the second court has misunderstood. Uh, my Lord, I'll need to look at the limits of that. Uh, have a look at a case called Starmark Enterprises and CPL. Starmark. Which is case I was in a long time ago. Yes, I'm, I'm grateful. I mean, the, the, the difficulty here is that there is one case layered on another. Yes. Um, and um, <clears throat> so it's a little bit of a house of cards. But, but you're prima facie right, of course, that the, there has to be an earlier case that the later case ought to have followed, but did not follow, which is why Cameron is not the only important case here, really. Stands, I think, on Longmore's judgment in Ineos as to whether that absent, whether Lord Justice Longmore's understanding of Cameron were, of, was correct and ought to have been followed by um, uh, the Master of the Rolls yes. and ought to be followed by us. Yes. Then I think it is open to us to say. Um, the Court of Appeal was bound by Ineos and its understanding of Cameron, and we he should have followed it, and so should we now. Yes, I think I think that's the probably one of the only routes we uh, can get through this in the way that the appellants want us to. Uh, my lord, I think the answer to that is that probably is I think the only route that we can through it, and it then raises the question, which I'll come back on tomorrow. On the limits of well, the, the rules of precedent in that situation. Well, it's a very difficult yeah. question because it's such a it's such a blunt authority. This can can it be good? But yes, okay. It's a, it, it, it's, I, my lord, I accept that it's a blunt authority. It's also it clearly isn't per incurium, and it's explaining the earlier cases, which adds an extra element of difficulty to it. But yes, yes, but you can't explain them totally wrongly. No, but one might distinguish. I, I mean, I have in mind a particular treatment of Ineos. So, if that is distinguished on a particular basis, um, which at least makes makes sense looking at it, it wasn't talking about interim injunctions 
Batiste then says that it was about instrumentation, then that makes his uh, muddled earth a hurdle, if I can put it that way. But I will come back tomorrow on those questions. Um, Mr. Giffen's note. summarise my response, at least on my primary submission to these different points um, on Canada Goose. It's page three of the note. <clears throat> um, at 11.1, the ratio of Canada Goose should be read as limited to protester cases. Sorry, I've just got to find it. Um, Was it submitted? Mm. More word. In email at no, no, I know where. I mean, I've got it. Sorry, I just wanted. I was looking in Word or PDF. In Word. Thank you. Which paragraph? Uh, paragraph eleven, page three. Yeah. I, 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 I don't have a lot to say about this because I, I, I think my answer is I hope clear from what I said already, but I thought it may be helpful just to give the headlines. But eleven one. It said the ratio of Canada Goose should be read as limited to protester cases. Well, I've addressed that um, just now. Uh, it's not in my submission the, the reasoning about Canada Goose. Um, further or alternatively, this is at two, that would conflict with um, several other cases. Uh, and um, well, again, without going back through those, but you have my submissions um, on each of those cases. And then three, there's a, a new point. Uh, the broad proposition is that the ratio of Canada Goose, the decision is to that extent per incurium on two bases. And the first one is that it is said to be based on forgetfulness of Bromley. Um, but of course, the court, we've been told, knew, knew oh, yeah, clearly, clearly. <laughs> Clearly, the court was aware of Bromley. Um, but, but the other problem with this is that, as Mr. Kiffin's note goes on really to acknowledge, um, the express acknowledgement in Bromley that such injunctions could, in appropriate circumstances, be granted on a final injunction, a final basis in encampment cases, can't be described as part of the ratio of the case. So, this is a very ambitious submission, which is that Canada Goose is per incurium because the court was in ignorance of something which wasn't the ratio in a case that they obviously knew about. Um, and the second point which is made for per incurium is it's, it was decided in ignorance or forgetfulness that the statutory provisions and case law which demonstrate that the Court of Appeal in Canada Goose was wrong to say at paragraph 92 that subject to an appeal, the trial in an injunction case would bring the litigation to an end. It's an assumption evidently fundamental to the court's conclusion about why there was a sharp line. Uh, and I think what's being referred to there uh, is the CPR rules, which enable people to challenge injunctions when they learn about them. But uh, again, uh, it's a very thin basis to try to distinguish Canada Goose with respect. And as, as is clear even from this description of Mr. Giffen's note, the court referred to the power, the right to appeal in that paragraph. They weren't looking at the CPR provisions, which have a similar effect, where one can bring, make an application if one um, learns uh, a, 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 of an injunction. Um, but they did refer to the right to power of an appeal, and uh, it's not enough in my submission to say that that really is, is the basis on which to say Canada Goose was, was per incurium. Um, can I just, before I move on to the uh, 187 issue, um, just also summarise my answers to the main points of distinction which have been urged on you. I said I'd come back to this. Um, 
Gamma is the first one, and I've dealt with Gamma at some length. Um, secondly, there's Mr. Anderson's argument that one could have a, a Wolverhampton-style injunction, um, which can be challenged, which builds in processes for review. Now, as regards challenges, um, I've made the point that any injunction against newcomers can be challenged. Um, indeed, any injunction against um, unidentifiable persons unknown could, could if, if such a thing could be made, could, could, could be challenged when they learn about it. So that is not, in my submission, a point of distinction. If I'm right about Cameron and about Canada Goose, that, that can't be a point of distinction. As regards reviews, it's worth noting that, that to say that an injunction can be reviewed is the same as saying uh, that it's a short injunction. So you have a series of short injunctions, or perhaps a longer one, which is subject to reviews. So that involves reading in a, a, an exception to Canada Goose for short injunctions um, against the world, which in my submission can't be found. There's no basis for that uh, in Canada Goose. And of course, it actually suffers from the same problem the fairness problem that Lord Sumption identified. Because if there is a problem, a fairness problem, perhaps there's not, but if there is a fairness problem with making uh, an injunction binding on newcomers, a final injunction binding on newcomers, then the fact that you make it once and then review it and make it again and then review it and make it again doesn't solve the fairness problem because at none of those reviews are the individuals affected actually present, which is the very thing that makes it unfair. Um, the third point of distinction was the point about trespass as being different. Um, and in fact, I think I've addressed this already when I started off and I was explaining um, that, that, that trespass actually doesn't provide an answer because although it is true that trespass is always unlawful, it is not true that one can therefore confidently say that an injunction will always be given against Maybe a balance of rights. But can I just test this question of suffering, or of the um, injunction always suffering the same fans <coughs> problem that Lord Sumption identified? Um, it, surely that leads to the conclusion that an interim injunction cannot be made against persons unknown, because whilst there may be a reason for it, um, namely to identify the people who are doing the damage. That's a distinction really without a difference. If it is unfair, fundamentally unfair, to grant an injunction to which nobody has the opportunity to um, make submissions, then it is unfair in all cases, and that has very far-reaching ramifications for the granting of uh, freezing injunctions and every other kind of ex parte injunction. So it's extrapolating, isn't it, from a, an unfairness which um, assumes every case goes to trial, assumes that a case will always be defended by a person who comes to hear of it, and takes no account of the realities I put to you earlier. Well, my Lord, I, put like that, I accept that there is, uh, as it were, a need to be flexible when one applies principles of fairness, because um, one could equally make the point that, well, the same point you've just put to me, one could make it as in relation to all of the against the world injunctions, where they're all made just by by definition, without the participation of any of the parties. I know you so, can, but the, the against the world injunctions, you know, the, the, the um, uh, injunctions against disclosing the identity of criminals uh, who've changed their identity is just so different from this that the, I find the, even the consideration of them unhelpful. I mean, here we're talking about real-life cases uh, that go on all day long. 
and you know that are serious problems for our society, right? And for the people in our society. Now, the the problem of of um, the, the whatever the the uh, venables is is a, a vanishingly rare problem and really doesn't inform the issues here. And if it does, then something is wrong with the law. But the reasoning in Cameron is structured on the basis that there is some fundamental difference between interim and final injunctions. And I cannot see how that can be the case um, in every case. It might be the case in some situations, but it cannot um, have been either argued or intended to be applicable everywhere. Can it? I mean, it would be absurd. Well, what I was um, intending, as it were, to, to agree with just my opponent's question, which is to say that it is clearly right that the fairness principle can't trump everything. That's obviously right, because yeah. it can't in the Against the World injunctions, um, it can't uh, in um, injunctions which are uh, interim. Um, so th th that's clearly right, my lord. And the way that it's been explained in the authorities is that in an interim injunction context, uh, there is, uh, well, my lord has the point, that, that there is an interim injunction context, you need to impose a provision holding the ring until final trial. But my lord, I ac accept, my lord, what what's been put to me, that the world is perhaps more complicated than that permits. But that is the basis on which interim injunctions have been treated differently on the authorities. Um, and in my submission, it's also that what one sees in in Cameron. It's quite um, difficult to fit Gamal into that box. Um, in Gamal, the injunction was granted. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Gamal was not then a party to anything. She arrives with her caravan after the order is made. It's explained to the, it's explained to her on the twenty first of April two thousand and five, and thereupon without any chance to say anything, she becomes not only a party to the action, says the Master of Rolls, but also in contempt of court. Absolutely. Now, if, if fairness is everything, it's difficult to see why that should be so, why she should be in contempt of court, not simply from the moment she finds out about the injunction, but from uh, the expiry of a reasonable time in which to challenge it or something along those lines. But the, the fact is that the Court of Appeal, approved by the Supreme Court, said that as soon as the injunction was explained to her on the 21st of April, she was there and then in contempt. Yes. Well, I'd accept that. And, and for uh, what she was committed. She was committed. Um, so, my, my Lord, I entirely accept that. And I've I'll show you the way that that is dealt with in my submission. It's dealt with as confined to uh, interim relief. But I, 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 I'm, as it were, not going to try to persuade you that that is a distinction which, if one had a blank sheet of paper, one would draw. Um, because, as I said, the world is more complicated. But that is, in my submission, the distinction. Uh, you say it's a Cameron distinction drawn in Camel and Camel de Goose. Yes. But the, the point is, this is a, a modern distinction. I mean, this all this has arisen in the last two years, which is quite remarkable. You know, when I came to look at this case, I came with a body of knowledge that was derived mostly, I'm afraid, from cases undertaken between 2009 and 2012, when I was a judge of the High Court. And that knowledge was, I, I found, when I read into this case, woefully <laughs> out of date. And, it, it, but the, the, the remarkable thing is that the world has changed between 2019 and 2021. In those five cases that led Mr. Justice Nicklin to gather all these other cases together and give rise to issue one. Yes. Yeah. Well, can, I, can I also, I mean, just ask you to think about this point, please, Mr. Jones. Um, I mean, isn't it usually the case that you can't get interim relief that you wouldn't get at trial. So 
that was assumed by uh, I think it was Mr Justice Morgan at the first instance. Well, I think it was decided by Mr Justice at first instance in Ineos and recorded by the Court of Appeal in that case. And it's very unusual to have a situation where you can get wide relief on an interim basis than you would be entitled to after a trial, isn't it? Yes, well, that is consistent, of course, with spike action. And that's why there is a, an interesting analogy there, because that, that is what happens in the spike action kind of injunction. You do have, to Mr Justice Eby's judgment on, on, on that, you do have wider protection on an interim basis. And when the House of Lords have looked at that, they've said that it's to protect the position pending trial. That's rather different. That, that, that's to do with third parties who, who aren't, um, who haven't been sued, but who interfere in the process of justice. Well, it's, yes, but they interfere by doing the thing that's been prohibited. So you have an injunction preventing publication against The Guardian and The Times publishers, and that, that's the conduct that is caught then by spycatcher. It's not assisting, I mean, assisting a breach of injunction is a different thing. In that sure. Case. But so um, that exception there, which is recognised in spycatcher and explained by the House of Lords as being based on the protection of the uh, judicial process. But, but that's not part of the relief you're claiming on an interim basis, and it's not the relief you're granted on an interim basis. It's, a, it's because of a separate principle. Yes, that's right. But I'm simply drawing the analogy between that and a case like Gamel, where, again, you I mean, the similarity is that in Gamel you go against named persons, you go against existing, potentially unidentifiable, but some of them are named, some of them are um, uh, existing persons unknown. And you obtain the injunction at that stage, but in the same way as a spy catcher injunction might prevent others from doing the conduct, that injunction also can be drafted in a way to prevent others doing the conduct. And it's then different when you get to the final trial, uh, where the question is, essentially, who's now done the conduct? So who is, can you identify anyone? Are there now identifiable people, in addition to the people who you've named as, as, as defendants? Um, but why can't you ask for and get protection into the future against people in the future doing doing the thing you don't want them to do? You, you say that's just not possible. Yes, unless it's within one of the against the world exceptions, that isn't possible. Mm. And of course, convoy collateral tells us that the enforcement principle allows you to get any amount of interim relief, whether you've got a cause of action or not. Well, but all of this... Which helps uh, you, by the way. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, it helps me a lot because in the sense that it's all built on the premise that interim relief is different. And um, it's different. Perhaps some of the reasons that have been given are not so strong as others, but ultimately it's different because if it's a properly interim case, it is given to protect the ring uh, pending the final trial. And it's at that final trial uh, that every person who is by then a defendant can participate. Uh, and the kind of gamel consequences, which on the face of them do seem rather un unfair on this gamel, that is a consequence which is tolerated in the interim context, but not in the final context. Right, so let's take stock of where we are. Uh, I, my lord, need to deal with 187B. Uh, I need to come back to my Article 8 point, but I'm only going to do that very briefly, but I do need to come back to that. Uh, I also need to come back to um, Ms Bolton's point, um, although my little summary of my answer to that is essentially my, my... The summary which I gave you to Ms Bolton's point is essentially my answer to it, so I won't be an awful mm -hmm. lot longer on that. I want to take you through the judgment on it. Um, I think, my Lord, I perhaps need another hour tomorrow morning, if that's possible. And your homework. Yes, my homework. Uh, yes. And if you do find anything on your homework, could you let um, uh, us all have the, you know, a note or whatever it is in the cases you intend to refer to as quickly as possible in the morning? Um, I, I, I certainly will. Well, look, my homework 
The homework is the flowchart exercise. I'm not, I'm not going to do the flowchart, but it's no, that, no, that, no. That, that exercise. No, no, I mean, if you've just got but some cases or some uh, some points yeah. you want to make, just give, give a notice, if you can, to uh, Mr. Gibbon and his colleagues and also to us. My Lord, there's a voice in the back of my mind saying I had another piece of homework. And since I don't have anyone else in court with me, I'm not sure whether anyone else will have a note of that. That's my only homework, isn't That's it? It wasn't anything else that the court's expecting. Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful. Yeah. Um, just for your information, I shall be giving judgment um, in open court at 10 o'clock tomorrow in another matter, uh, which may be a rather busy occasion. So you might want to stay out of, um, you might want to stay out of the way here until 10.15. Um, 10.30.